In a state bordering a conflict zone, you are under the constant specter of existential threat. The ability of the nation state to support its citizens, and indeed any other people that need to seek asylum, seek refugee status, is necessarily contingent on your ability to uphold the security of that nation state. It is principle, like, we have two things to prove to you in this speech. One, we're going to be talking about the principle of the duties and obligations that people owe to states and owe to their own states. And then secondly, we'll be talking about the practical benefits that accrue from this policy. But let's make one thing absolutely clear. What the opposition have to prove to you today is that states have some obligation to take in citizens that are not their own with no return, right? We think you need, they need to prove that there is some sort of obligation that these states have to help these people out without anything back. We don't think that they're going to be able to do that. So a couple of things just to clarify before we launch into substantive, right? What we mean by this is people seeking long-term asylum status. We're not talking about refugees in temporary refugee camps who are being moved on elsewhere because we think principally those who, like, it's, it's consistent with the principle because those people don't drain the same amount of resources from that state as they would if they were seeking permanent asylum, right? Secondly, in terms of countries close to conflict, I mean, either where refugees are coming from that conflict bordering, or if refugees are coming from further away and there is still a conflict near that state, that existential threat is still present and we would require that military service. All right, two things then. First, let's talk about the nation state, what it is as a construct, and why this policy is therefore so necessary, right? So a nation state is not just a sort of abstract concept or lines drawn on a map, right? It's an aggregation of resources, an aggregation of individuals and capital and resources in order to protect the people who live between those borders, right? That is what it does. So insofar as the state aggregates these services and provides people with things, you have a principled obligation if you receive things to give things back. That's not just to the structure of the nation state, but it's also to the other individuals who live within it. No, thank you. For example, things like states, in, it, it, states provide people with taxes and demand that you give something back to the other people within it. They provide you, they demand you provide something to that state in the same way that like you might work to improve the economy, right? There are things that the state expects of you, right? Point. So we expect that specifically the reason why military service is the area that we would want refugees to be working in is twofold. One, we think you guarantee the security of the state in which you can have a larger and more productive standing army, right? We think that means that these people are more likely to be serving in a state sector, but also it means that they are able to actually protect the Why? borders and the stability of that state. It is the stability of that state that is the basis on which everything else rests. So any other service that state can provide to refugees is primarily something that comes at the, uh, at the cost of being able to maintain its, its uh, status as a state, right? But second thing, we think this provides a clear incentive to states to take more refugees, right? The counterfactual in this debate is states having to drain their resources when they are near a conflict zone, when they are under a state of, of existential threat. And we think chances are these people are going to reject these people and not grant them asylum status. So what this policy does is it creates a clear benefit for the state when they take refugees and encourages them then to take these people in because they have something to gain. They have a year of military service, right? We think, furthermore, right. the Actions of any one state can change the way that other states act, right? I'll take you in one second. So what this means is that when you have this strong military, when you can stabilize that kind of region, it means you're more likely to see uh, you're more likely to see this area stabilizing. Yes. Do you really think that Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon are an existential threat from the Syrian civil war? Like I think there is probably the feeling that they are at a that they are at a threat from the refugees flooding into their country, and the way you change that narrative and increase the political will of taking refugees in is by saying we have naturalized them as citizens of our state, we have naturalized them more quickly, right? So that actually leads me nicely into the practical benefits of this, right? And also the policy still like still applies. The principle applies of giving something to the state. We're happy in areas that are like less like more far away from conflict zones to demand they work in other state sectors, work as like police officers, work as firemen, right? Like happy to have that. But what we want specifically is when you're close to conflict zones than to work in the military because that is where the political will is best advocated, right? So now, secondly, let's move on to the idea of the practical benefits that you gain from this, right? So one of the major practical benefits is the idea that refugees become naturalized more quickly. They become apparently, they become very obviously not a threat to the state that they are in, in terms of both public perceptions of them and also in terms of the way the state observes them, right? So you no longer have this idea of like strange people entering your country that you don't know, that you don't understand the motivations of, because it's immediately obvious that if these people want their long-term asylum in this state, they are willing to serve it for a year. They're also willing to serve it for a year in a structure that demands their, that, that demands they like 
capitulate to some of the ideologies of that state, right? So it means you clearly know that this person is not an enemy of your state because they have given up their time and they have given up their uh, like their resources and energy in order to protect that state. That means you naturalize refugees. Furthermore, we think you deal with the problem of what often happens to asylum seekers who either don't speak the language or who struggle to find jobs because their qualifications don't translate. The amount of like poverty that, that challenges asylum seekers when they get in. The, the, chances that people tend to either move to crime or perceive to move to crime, right? Because you already have a, a military, right, a state machine that has existed to train people with little to no skills to be, uh, to have those kind of skills and be employable, right? So it's twofold. One is the signaling effect that you give to everyone that these refugees are not in fact a threat or an existential risk, but rather people who belong in our country. But further than that, I think you also provide these people with skills, right? Particularly important in countries close to conflict zones, where their economies are usually under the most risk, right, and at the most threat because foreign direct investment doesn't really exist. So one of the best things you can do then is provide these people with the skills necessary to then move on and work into the state, right? But secondly, we think in terms of the political will that there is to provide housing and to provide asylum, you change not only the way the state functions, but also the way citizens function, right? Because we think the idea the, that you are threatened by the refugees in your country or you are threatened by the border or by the country of those refugees have come from is probably intuitively justified, right? The point at which you can see a conflict happening over that border and where fear-mongering often exists surrounding refugees. So think what happens then is that People in that state no longer feel that refugees are a drain on their resources, but instead they feel like they are being given something back by taking the people in. And that changes the political will towards helping those refugees, and it also changes the way that people act around them. So then you decrease the chances of these people feeling unsafe in those states, which also decreases the threats of things like radicalization, where you feel like you don't belong in a certain state where you've been put. But more than that, the military is a particularly good tool at fighting that kind of thing, right? Because it is a structure that exists to perpetuate the state and its the state identity. So we think when you get people to buy into the state in that way by giving up, uh, by giving something up for a year, you have benefits both for those people individually and what they are given uh, in terms of what they give to the state, but also benefits in terms of the, the cohesion of states themselves, right? So the case is twofold, right? At the end of the day, there is no principal obligation to help people from other states. There's only an obligation to help your own citizens, where you can help your citizens best while also helping others. I think that's where this policy works best, and that's why I'm very, very proud to do this. Status quo, given the characterization of GOV, it's already extremely hard to get countries to treat refugees as human beings. What this move does is fundamentally treat refugees as objects and harms how they're treated and how they're looked at in the country they go to and the reasons why they're accepted. Firstly, let's clear up where this debate happens. This debate happens in states like, as the closing opposition points out in POI, like Jordan and Lebanon. It happens in states like Uganda, New York, Somalia, and South Sudan, for example, right? We think like we are ready from opposition to stand by having international fundings of refugee camps in these regions, ready to also, if the need for security is so dire, have peacekeeping forces on the borders of these countries. We are willing to stand by all of that. We just don't think there should be conditions placed on why refugees get asylum. First thing to note on burdens is our government tells us that a burden is to show that states should take in people without like any obligation. Right? Firstly, that's true maybe for immigrants. I think in terms of refugees, your burden is to stop people from dying, in which case it's a moral yeah, burden to take, in, take them in, and it shouldn't be a nice thing that states do. We think it's an obligation. Secondly, we think there is a large degree often of states having do actually get long-term benefits from refugees when they do integrate and do help societies. But third logic, thirdly, if their logic applies that states have no obligation to refugees, by their logic, they would also have to stand by refugees having to pay a cost to come into a state or would have to like pay a fee to come into a state. We don't think they're going to be willing to stand by putting financial burdens on refugees. We don't know why they'll stand by putting a military burden on refugees. So what, what Gov actually has to show you is two things. One, why there should be a burden on refugees to serve for these countries. And secondly, what kind of rights that, are, that they're willing to take away from refugees. Saying that, there are two arguments from leader of opposition. One, why, like in terms of setting of norms, should refugees be always taken in free of obligation? And secondly, how are these like, refugees likely to be treated once they join the arms? Firstly, on like norm setting, right? We think well, for the reason is of sometimes to give an offer to an individual is or have a bargain with an individual is when they have other options to exercise. Which means that 
I have an incentive to make the terms of my offer as feasible to you if you can refuse that offer, right? The point at which like that these refugees have no option but to take up this offer, we are unsure why the terms of this offer will be anything good, right? I think it's sure, it starts with one year of military service. But at the point at which you have a norm of asking refugees to give certain things in exchange for asylum, what this fundamentally alters is the way you look at refugees. So we are unsure whether this is likely to just stop at short term, like giving them short term military service. Because the three major actors which will push for asking more and more rights of refugees at the point at which they can't refuse. We think, given politicians have an incentive, as they point out, to pander to populist rhetoric or anti refugees, we think these politicians are much more likely in the long term to ask for more and more rights at the point of which there's a norm of asking refugees to give up certain things in exchange for asylum. Secondly, we think military generals now have like a huge incentive to ask for these refugees to stay longer and serve in worse conditions. Thirdly, given as they point out, the public is anti-refugee. These public will be, the public will be very happy throwing them into whatever kind of conflicts that are there. The public is going to be very happy in asking them to give away more and more rights at the point of which the norm of the refugees giving up certain things free of obligation, right? The second thing to note on setting up norms is international norms, right? Because no. PM points out that the actions of one state affects how other states behave in terms of taking in refugees. The push for getting in more refugees right now is to say that it's a moral humanitarian obligation that all states should take up. So there are countries like Jordan and Lebanon who take in, as they point out, a large number of refugees. So Jordan's taken 600,000 refugees when they have a population of 3 million and put them in refugee camps and they do that on a humanitarian level because other countries push them and the UNHRC like helps fund those refugee camps. Right? We think but what happens now is that all these countries that do currently take in refugees as an international obligation now see now that firstly the politician and public that we pointed out see that they can take in refugees by putting a condition on what these refugees can do, which means the countries that do presently take in refugees unconditionally are much more likely to put conditions like this on how the refugees are likely to be treated. Again, also note that a lot of countries in the future are not likely to take in refugees until the refugees are ready to give up certain rights, either paying for military service or like uh, or like paying a certain cost. So we think this idea that people are going to take in more refugees is one unclear given now countries will pay post imposition of refugees, but we're not sure whether that's a good thing given that taking in refugees is more likely to become conditional as opposed to unconditional as it happens in status quo. And finally on this, we think now refugees knowing that they have to go into a country and sacrifice certain rights to be put into military service are now also likely to be more afraid of going to these countries given they're already afraid of persecution. We are unsure whether they are going to be feel safe in going to this country, so we are not sure they are taking more refugees. That response to that. But before I talk to you about how these left refugees are likely to be treated in the military and why that's a bad thing, I'll take closing. This round isn't about all refugees, it's about long-term asylum seekers. So how do you determine how to give away those fungible spots for long-term asylum? Would you have it rather be arbitrary on your side of the house? See, like, let's be completely honest. So there's no such thing right now on short-term asylum for refugees because these conflicts are very long term. We think it's unrealistic for you to say you give them short-term asylum and not long-term asylum because the rhetoric in the countries you talk about is that there is no such thing as short-term asylum because they're here to stay. You have to defend that and you can't get away with this sneaky short-term asylum business. Okay, how are these refugees like? Government already claims to in the characterization that people don't want them to come in, right? There's a differentiation in how citizens and refugees are treated. So we think from opposition that's very likely that they're treated like objects within the army. How does this manifest itself? Firstly, we think they're going to be put in front of the line, right? So don't think this skills giving and having nice little training is going to happen this one year that they talk about. We think they're going to be handed some guns, put in front of the line and told to fight, right? We think that we don't see how they're going to get like a decent life inside the society. Secondly, we think given that these countries are resource, resource crunched, we're not sure what kind of equipment they're going to give refugees who are obliged to give the service to them. So we're not sure if they're going to get things like guns or things like shields at the point at which they're put in front of the line without when it's they're obliged to do so. Thirdly, we think things like healthcare in the future, things like if they get hurt, whether they're going to get healthcare, whether they're going to get care inside hospitals, is very unlikely at the point at which you think these refugees are obliged to serve for you and you have no obligation towards them in return. We think it's very unlikely that you give them these kind of basic services that you give army members once you create a differentiation in terms of refugee people who are working for your army and citizens who are working for your army. Fourthly, we think that there's going to be much a large degree of like mistrust inside the army and conflict inside the army, which hurts the fundamental functioning of how the army works. That's the problem.
at the end of this, we think what these refugees are likely to be treated as are human shields who are like who who are going to the front of the line through slaughter. You're taking them away from a country where they're running from slaughter and running from fear, putting them in front of the line for another piece of fighting. You're very proud. Yeah, yeah. I thank the leader for his remarks and calling on the Deputy Prime Minister to deliver the government's response to your is no difference between a long-term and a short-term refugee, then this debate is probably meaningless. We would posit that there does exist such a distinction. There is a distinction between housing someone in a temporary camp in your borders that you intend to either return to the zone they came from or move on to a third country. We think that political will in terms of international funding is probably greatest for these projects. It is when you take a refugee and turn them and make them a citizen of your country, when you grant them asylum for a long term, that is when you outweigh the greatest cost to that citizen. That is when you therefore can, as a state, demand the most in return. And unfortunately, it is that act of granting these people citizenship that meets the most opposition internally within a country from the pre-existing citizenry, and is that that we circumvent by this policy. So, three things in this speech. Firstly, a rebuttal. Secondly, a bit more on the direct principles. And thirdly, how exactly specifically we undermine the political backlash to taking refugees that means ultimately, on the our side of the house, we get more refugees housed better for us. So, rebuttal. The first thing that he points out is that refugees are just going to be treated really awfully in the military. They're going to have rubbish guns that we use as human shields and in various ways that presumably violate the Geneva Convention. I would suggest that insofar as the state is likely to do this with refugees, that it's probably unlikely to do the kind of things that they suggest is the alternative in this world, providing them with nice housing, nice health care, etc. We suggest they'll probably do horrible things on either side of the house if they are that kind of state. But secondly, at least we gave a mechanism by which you can like, decrease the willingness of that state to want to do nasty things to refugees. So we're winning on both counts there. Secondly, he says, look, Jordan and Turkey have taken lots of refugees. So... To the extent that this is true, a couple of things on this. Firstly, one of the reasons why these states have taken refugees is because their borders are porous, they are unable to protect them. It is not necessarily an extension of political will that says we really want to take lots of refugees. Secondly, we say that actually there is a massively increasing backlash in these communities from the taking of refugees. We would suggest that actually, given that the refugees are there, and often the kind of refugees they're talking about are short-term rather than long-term refugees, there haven't been a huge numbers of Turkish or Lebanese citizenships handed out to these refugees, we would suggest that it is unclear why that, that is a necessarily you know, robust counterfactual to our side of the debate, not least because the political will has rapidly evaporated. Insofar as that was something that happened, that happened very immediately, and the political will has now stopped. What we're trying to do is create a sustainable solution that translates not only for this conflict, but for conflicts going into the future. No, thank you. And also, the, you know, the temporary camps in those places are awful, so if that's really what you want to hang your counterfactual on, I prefer our model. So, principle. So, on the, what it means to be a true existential threat to your state, because we've got a POI from closing off that says, look, Turkey, the nation of Turkey, is probably unlikely to fall as a result of the Syrian conflict. And that is fine. That is true. But that is not the limit to which a state being proximate to a conflict zone can have be massively curtailed in its ability to grant rights to its citizens. We would posit that, for example, things like the New Year's attack that happened yesterday in Turkey shows that there are clear and present dangers to being near a conflict zone. We suggest that the fact that you have to divert resources away from things like state welfare programs and into Why? things like your military because a conflict is ongoing means that there are massively massive drains on your resources even if it is the case that your state isn't likely to fall. But also, we think that this conflict zone creates and perpetuates the kind of political climate that we're talking about. Even if Turkey Please. isn't likely to fall, the fact that the borders are porous, the fact that they perceive these refugees, and this is particularly in the case of 
the conflicts that we're talking about, where refugees are coming from the conflict zone that you're proximate to, there is often a fear that that conflict will spill over into your borders by virtue of taking on those refugees. Note that this is particularly prevalent in the kind of conflicts that we're seeing taking place now and into the future, where it's often not large states uh, fighting against each other, but often particular civil wars or particular aggregations of people based on ethnic tensions or religious tensions, which means that often tactics like guerrilla tactics, like terrorism, are much more likely to happen on the kind of things that you can see bleeding over into your state, which is why we do see terror attacks in Istanbul. It's why we saw the IRA bombing things in gunfight. Ultimately, we therefore suggest that even if your state is not under threat of being completely destroyed, you have a significant burden and necessarily are either likely to prioritise your own citizenry, but secondly, probably have at least some principal duty to do so, given that they are the people that make up your state, they are the people that voted in that government, they are the people that paid your taxes, etc. And maybe it would be the case that in the long term, refugees paying back taxes by getting employment would discharge some of this duty. But it's unclear how that duty is discharged at the point at which they come in. So. Next, um, they say refugees will be less likely to go to these countries as a result of this. If it is the case that the refugee has a meaningful choice about which country they can go to, that probably undermines the first half of your case, which is to say that there is no ability for refugees to consent into this because they are forced to do so. I would suggest that maybe some refugees can choose, or some refugees are more harmed by the conflict. We would suggest that, therefore, this probably means that the refugees that are most in need of long-term asylum and are most able to make that choice are probably the ones that are most likely to come. So we probably get a better allocation of the finite number of long-term resource places in general. Next, then, on the practical consequences, particularly with regards to political will. Before that, closing. Will you send Syrian refugees who were given asylum under this policy back to the Syrian front to fight during their military service? I mean, like, no, because what we're saying is that the state should use these refugees to protect its own borders, right, when you are proximate to the conflict zone. If, you know, we're not saying that Germany, for example, should send all its Syrian refugees to go fight in Syria, because Germany does not presently exist in a state of conflict. Next, um, I also just think that would probably be a bad use of military resources, right? So it's not something unlikely, states are unlikely to do. But particularly, when we have to understand the political co co context of this debate, it is not the case that states are very willing to take on large amounts of refugees presently. Why? Because often the people in those states perceive those refugees as a drain on society. They see them doing things like, because of the lack of economic opportunities afforded to them, which have been exacerbated by the fact that your state is in a conflict zone, doing things like having to resort to petty crime, right? Or like things or crimes that come about out of existing cultural differences, right? The result is that the, it takes very little to create a large amount of anti-refugee sentiment in your country. Importantly, there is no existing counter-narrative that says these refugees are clearly of benefit to us now. Because any counter-narratives are like, oh, but they're nice people, we just need to give them time to, you know, learn the language and get jobs. But all those benefits about taxes, etc., only come about in the future. When you're in a state of conflict, your concern on the safety and security of your family now. When we say these people are coming over here, they are fleeing from a war zone, and their repayment to us, to help us, we provide them with citizenry and service and the skills the military can provide. But in return, they guarantee our security. That is an incredibly powerful tool to counteract the anti-refugee rhetoric that exists on both sides of the house. Ultimately, we provide you with a clear principle and a clear mechanism by which we can get more refugees and better refugees. For both of those reasons, we are comfortably winning the top half of this debate. Go on, Jenkia. Thank you. 
first on this question of obligation and does it really work in the way, the way opening government thinks it does. Secondly, on military security and does this really like tangibly increase their military security in, like, in a way that you're willing to trade off the rights of refugees. And finally, on the perception of refugees and integration, right? Let's talk about obligation. In their first speech, they have a very naive characterized organization of obligation in terms of ah, reciprocity. So you give these people something and we, you get something back in return. They drop that in the second speech because of the response coming in our first speech about the fact that you can only have a meaningful version of reciprocity when the person on the other side of that bargain has any yeah, yeah. meaningful opt-out whatsoever. When the comparative is death and bombs and death squads, we don't think that these people are in any position whatsoever to negotiate or to say no, right? Which means in these circumstances, we say it's fundamentally illegitimate that you impose any forms of reciprocity or obligation. But then in their second speech, they drop that completely and then pick up of CG's POI on this like short term, long term distinction, right? Look. The kind of conflicts that we're talking about reasonably don't have an end in sight. At the very least, the people who are fleeing from these conflicts don't see that they're going to be going back anytime soon, right? Which means from the point of view of the people who are making this decision, the most preferable thing for them to take in that instance is long-term asylum, right? Which means everybody who is entering that country wants long-term asylum. Secondly, nobody wants to be moving around from country to country with their bags packed when they have literally no idea where they're going to go, where they're going to sleep that night, who is going to take them in, right? Which means that the first country they enter into is the country they're likely to, like, yeah, yeah. going to place most of their bets on in terms of trying to stay there, right? Which means even if like, there is a distinction between this like short term, long term, we think the people who are making this choice don't see it, right? Which means when you give them an option of like trading away their rights and trading away like all of the harms that we talked about with respect to entering into military service, they're going to do it anyway because they don't see any other option inside, which is why we think it's fundamentally illegitimate, right? But the final thing to say about this short term, long term distinction, look, the people who are like, causing the kind of backlash that opening government talks about with respect to refugees, we aren't going to make this distinction between short term and long term anyway, right? We, we don't know who these nuanced right wingers are. Yeah, yeah. The distinction between like people who are here for some time and for a longer time. We think they're likely to point at all of them in the same way as like people who aren't our citizens and hence don't deserve all of these rights and privilege, which means the benefits that they talked about aren't likely going to exist, right? So what we proved to you so far, we showed you that you can only impose an obligation insofar as the other side or the other party has any meaningful way to opt out of it. There is absolutely no way that happens in this debate, right? But secondly, and given that we've already proved this, we think we win the debate on legitimacy. Let's talk about outcomes and why we think those are also not going to manifest in the way in which government would have you believe, right? So, so they talk about military security and there being a need for it, right? First thing to note is they never really proved a direct and pressing need for military security in these countries, right? To the extent that they're talking about sporadic terrorist attacks in Turkey, we think that the solution to that is better intelligence and cooperation yeah, yeah. with intelligence authorities around the world, not putting refugees on the front line of conflict, right? That's a problem solution mismatch. But then the second thing that they say in their first speech is that ah, we're going to have a larger army as though that like that, as though that analysis literally substitutes for better military service, right? Yeah, yeah. So we told you that the kind of people you're going to be taking into this army are refugees who ostensibly have no military training or any like expertise to be there yeah, in the yeah. first place which means that first like either you're just putting them in like in, into the service for one year without any training or capability whatsoever which means we're unsure how useful they're going to be in those situations or secondly you put them through like years of military service and then ask one year of like military training and then ask one year of military service from them which means that the kind of things that you're demanding of them are already going up and we've already told you that this continues to go up when you see that you can demand anything off of your refugees and they're going to accept it anyway because they don't have a choice. Which means they didn't show us why military security goes up on their side of the house. We provide the alternatives in a way that we can deal with it, right? But what does this need to be traded off with, right? And they just brush off our argument about abuse of refugees within the military, right? And the response to that is the Geneva Convention. Guys, we're talking about conflict zones here, like the Geneva Convention reasonably doesn't apply in like the, these places which often tend to be a very, very big mess, right? We told you that politicians and generals will always make a distinction between their own 
who are in the army and refugees who are in the army, which means that any time any costs need to be cut or anybody needs to be put in a dangerous situation, it's the refugee that's going to be pushed ahead of the line, right? In order to put them in such grave danger, they needed to show us like concrete benefits existing out of these refugees being there in the first place. They've never done that, which means we can never trade off the harms to these refugees that they're likely to face in this debate. But before I move on, sure. sure. So there is no way to refuse to obey the laws of your state or to opt out of paying taxes. Given that, is that an illegitimate demand state put on people by your logic of how state okay, demands no, people think? No, again, this is like super generic, right? Like we aren't talking about like regular <laughs> citizens who are paying taxes in the first place. Like we're talking about refugees like who are literally fleeing from death. And insofar as they do start paying taxes later after the yeah, yeah. asylum, we think can then start demanding these things of them, not before you give them the refugees. Yeah, yeah. in the first place, right? That's how obligation flows disingenuous. Okay, let's talk about perception of refugees and integration, right? Look, on our side of the house, when the global narrative of accepting refugees is one of being a humanitarian cause, which means when countries want to accept refugees because they see the dead body of a Syrian child on the beach, is when we think that all of these, like all, all of the basic rights are still going to be given on our side of the house because countries see it as an obligation, as something that they must do to just be like nice countries and be perceived as nice in the world. On the comparative, when they see refugees as a means to an end and merely instruments for providing national security, is the point at which we think that they're going to abuse them and they're going to treat them as objects, right? Very, very proud of yeah, yeah. I think it's even crazy when I see how I can never play it. Just let me get your pops if you can actually get it. Obviously, it's going to be impossible to take all of the long-term refugees you want to take. So what we're talking about is a debate about what methods you're actually going to use to decide which refugees you're going to take. So what we're going to bring to you today from closing government is an analysis about why this method of the way in which you decide who you're granting long-term refugee status to is the best way to uh, do this mechanism and is particularly helpful in helping the worst off refugees. And secondarily, we're also going to talk about how this is going to help with like wider, uh, wider acceptance of society and help for the refugees in a, a much more in-depth way than opening matters to get to. So let's start by talking about some direct refutation though with some coercion points. Because I think that the coercion points that we're hearing out of opening uh, opposition are in a lot of ways utterly ridiculous. So there's several reasons for this. First and foremost, I don't actually think they're able to give you a particularly compelling reason for it. Just because maybe in a hypothetical world you can see these abuses, why countries are actually going to carry out these abuses, like dropping these refugees into the front lines of a combat zone without any guns? Why do we think this is true? So like, first and foremost, a lot of countries that take refugees are rather liberal countries. Europe takes refugees, Canada takes refugees. Shame. I don't think Justin Trudeau is going to do this to anybody. But like, Shame. additionally, I also think that like Turkey isn't, uh, but I also think that like when we're talking about countries like Turkey or Jordan, we're not talking about random warlords. We're talking about still like respected governments that probably don't have a whole lot of incentive to just let these people die on the battlefields. And a big reason why this is true is because there would probably be a whole lot of international condemnation would come from this. Do you know why? Because the because what they're talking about is just a violation of a whole lot of international laws. It's a violation of Geneva Conventions. It can lead to all kinds of condemnations that I'm sure these countries wouldn't like to do. I'm sure all of their liberal allies wouldn't like them doing this either when they see how awfully messed up this is. So I don't really think you're actually going to be doing this. But like third and foremost, there's honestly, you don't even have to think. They're just like assuming that there's going to be having these people fighting anyway. There's so many other things that you can do in a military. You could have, you could be a cook, you could be a driver, you could have an admin desk job. There's literally infinite what? other options that these people could have in the military anyway. So I don't really see how they can even show you that this is all that worse. I've been waiting you down to like 10 seconds, dude. So now let's get started by talking about why this is going to be best to help out the worst off refugees. So when we're talking about long-term asylum seekers, we're often talking about the worst persecuted refugees because the short-term asylum seekers ultimately are short-term because they want to go back to their country when they can. But long-term people, people who are trying to leave permanently, are the ones who feel they can never go back to their countries. So we think it's incredibly important to try to help these people out. So what else, how do we think that they're actually going, how do we think that countries are going to make the decision to take these refugees in, in absence of the mechanism we are proposing on government? Most likely it's going to be 
A either just random or arbitrary, which is what my partner pointed out in his POI, something that I don't think is actually particularly helpful to a whole lot of people, or the most likely system that we think they're going to use as an alternative is countries are only going to take in refugees if they see something that can get as a rational self-interest. Maybe they can offer something to their economy. Maybe those refugees have some kind of specialized trade skills. We think that those are going to be the refugees that countries are going to try to target. Now, I don't think that's very good, and I don't think that's very good because that excludes a lot of the worst off refugees. It excludes the ones that don't have as many resources. It excludes the ones that don't have as much money. It excludes the ones that aren't as well educated. So, we don't think that's going to be great. So, why do we think that military service is just better in this regard? Because military service is something that is simply most wide, much more widely accessible. It gives countries a way in which to have a much wider pool of people in which it can offer asylum to. So, we think it's going to be like quite good in that regard. But, the uh, second area of analysis that I want to discuss is going to be about the social acceptance and advancement. But before I go on, uh, go on, I'll take a POI from back half. How well do you imagine that the armies in the countries that we're talking about treat women? Treat women? So obviously the armies in the countries that treat women, some treat them better than others. Obviously, like there's countries like uh, like Turkey where like obviously like it's not like always great. Like still these oftentimes are like yeah, yeah. countries and things like that. I don't actually think this is something that they should realistically worry about. But I also think this is going to play into like the social acceptance point that I'm going to be talking about anyway and things like that. So as far as like social advancement and societal acceptance, I think this is going to have two main impacts. It's first going to do things to help asylum seekers, and it's secondly going to help the, the countries themselves. So why do we think that? this model is a very good way to help asylum seekers. I have five reasons. So, the first one is that obviously allowing these people to get military service is just straight up good because it gives these people an established income when they go into the country. It gives them a job and a way to actually make money. This is incredibly important because first and foremost, oftentimes with the like, there's a lack of skills for alternative sorts of jobs. Anyway, maybe you don't know the language or you don't have other skills for other kinds of jobs in the country you're trying to get into. But secondarily, there could oftentimes maybe be discrimination that can preclude you from getting a lot of other jobs that maybe aren't necessarily going to be offered by the state and things like that. Secondarily, we also think that this is going to be helpful in that it can give you a sense of like future skills. Oftentimes, military service can grant you like access to a lot of things down the road, like engineering skills. It can grant you easier access to jobs in security or public safety or things like that. The third thing we would argue is that you can also oftentimes get long-term military benefits from serving. You can get things like health, more likely to be able to access things like education, all things that are good and unique to military service. We would argue that fourth, the fact that these people are now serving in the military is probably going to likely provide the impetus for state to be more likely to help refugees. So if they know that these people are going to be serving in combat, they're more likely to give them maybe like language training if there's a new country they have to worry about or things like that. But the final thing that I want to talk about is about the like, also about under this, is about the like respect that you're also more likely to see refugees get. So that I think is incredibly important as well. Because recognize that when somebody serves in the military, as I guess we discussed in prior rounds of this tournament, there's oftentimes a, a hero worship that accompanies that. Because there's the almost idealization of the sacrifice that you're putting into that. Something that I think is also very helpful for making sure there's more of a widespread acceptance society. But the final thing that I want to talk about is about why this is ultimately going to help countries in the long run. So, here's the thing. It's generally rather widely recognized that taking in refugees and immigration in general is something that helps countries' economies in the long run, but however, there's obviously short-term transition costs. So an important thing to analyze in this debate is how we can best ensure that we can minimize short-term transition costs while enabling countries to long-term actualize and the long-term costs, which means they're ultimately going to therefore be more willing to accept more refugees. Now, I think that military service is a great way to do this because one of the biggest fears that countries have with long-term asylum seekers is that when they let these people in, they're not going to be able to find jobs. There's going to be widespread unemployment and you're going to be having a whole lot of people who are poor, unable to work, and not really able to do a whole lot, and are just going to be a strain on on social services. We would argue that obviously the military, by serving in the military, you directly avoid this problem because there is a greater time window before these people are actually now having to like enter into society and take advantage of those services. So they're going to be able to get guaranteed income and things like that. But secondarily, this also ensures that there's now that long-term training and presence, those long-term skills, that longer-term greater likelihood of being able to find a job or greater employment. So this means that a whole lot of the fears that states have when they decide to take refugees in the first place, the fear that these people will forever ever be unemployed, the fear that these people won't actually be able to take care of themselves, a lot of those fears are much more likely to go away, so they'll be much more likely to take more refugees. That's pretty moral. We're proud to propose.
opposing government may have been right when they said that this debate is about allocating a finite number of spots for long-term asylum to refugees, but the substantial concern that we have at closing opposition is that that finite number of spots will be allocated disproportionately to single men, as opposed to women who are far more discriminated against as refugees, or the refugees who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, of which there are many who are fleeing from states that are previously conflict zones. We would prefer that those people got assistance they are the most vulnerable. Three points in this speech. Firstly, I'm going to add, add, engage in a bit of a rebuttal of opening half. Secondly, I'm going to talk in more depth about how this policy discriminates against women and those with post-traumatic stress disorder. And finally, I'm going to talk about cross-border flow of refugees, why this makes it worse, and the implications on the narrative that we've already been discussing in some depth in this debate. Firstly, on notes in the opening half. The opening government says it's important that states get something in return. We think the reason that all states signed, or many states signed, the UN Charter of Refugees is because they knew that when they engaged in that norm, they guaranteed their citizens the right to seek asylum in the future if they ever needed it. Insofar as these are states that are suffering from an existential threat, like the opening government asserts that they are, that's a particularly important thing for your state to be able to access. If you're worried that the state of Lebanon is no longer able to exist, you want the people of Lebanon to be able to access asylum easily. That is the thing that you get in return, even if we bought that you needed one, which we did not. Refugees deserve assistance. Secondly, they say that you improve the narrative. The comment we want to make about the narrative surrounding refugees is that narratives about refugees are often spread on the basis of small individual stories that colour everyone's perception of those refugees. A great example of that is that after sexual assaults that occurred in Cologne last year, a lot of people in Germany decided they didn't want refugees in their country anymore because they don't care about macro stories like lots of them joining the army, they care about individual stories. We think that there will be individually problematic stories within this military narrative because we think some of the refugees, for instance if you're a Syrian refugee who's asked to return to the Syrian front by the state of Turkey, are likely to do things like commit treason or not fight particularly well, which we think creates those individual problematic narratives that will overcome any positive counter-narrative that the government bench asserts might exist. Finally, the government bench asserts that there are some practical benefits, both to the refugees themselves, which just came out at closing, or to the states. Insofar as a refugee feels like they can get some kind of benefit from joining the army, they obviously still can. That's not a reason for these states to only accept refugees that come from that particular place. But as to whether or not the countries themselves benefit, Firstly, we pointed out in a, in a point of information that the opening government was at the very least overstating the military risk that existed to a place like Turkey. If there's no way that suffering an existential threat from a Syrian civil war, we think that's true of most places. In fact, the very reason that refugees flee to a lot of these countries is because they, despite being near conflict zones, they are not in conflict themselves. Secondly, it's only a year's worth of conflict. And thirdly, they're like, unlikely to be good soldiers because if you're a Syrian refugee who is asked to participate in the Turkish army that is currently fighting in Syria, you're unlikely to be particularly interested in that conflict. You're likely to feel like you're, you're, like, like you're, you're attacking people that you were once connected to or that you're hurting the conflict in a really problematic way. That's also true if you're suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, which we think a lot of these refugees are, which is going to lead me nicely into this first prong of extension. But before I get to it, so your analysis just proves why you might not want to put these refugees on the front line. There are lots of other military services that they provide, things like you know collecting intelligence or basically allowing like food into and out of the country. I mean, there are plenty of things you can be used for in the military without demanding they go into direct conflict. Uh, that's true, but we think at least some of them will be asked to go into direct conflict, which creates the negative stories that I just talked about. And it, uh, but the second comment that I'd make is it's unlikely that refugees, who, for example, don't speak the language, will find it particularly easy to engage in, as you say, military intelligence. So we think that the number of tasks you can complete is somewhat restricted. Fighting is, okay, is, is, is something that you know, crosses borders a bit better, unfortunately. Back to this point about discrimination against women. We think that the allocation of the refugees in our alternative will, will, will probably and hopefully be relatively random, because that includes 50% women, which is better, better than the very few women that they'll get on their side. Even if we take closing government's alternative story, that you'll have some sort of complex screening process and only accept the refugees who you think will be helpful. We point out that that is likely to be gender balanced and it's quite difficult to do that, which is to say it's hard to know which particular refugees are going to be helpful to your economy in the future and which ones won't because of the complexity surrounding the law, which is why we think a random allocation is more likely. Why are women going to feel uncomfortable joining these armies? Firstly, in some countries, having women in the army is just illegal, which means you just crowd out women from being able to seek asylum in these places in the first instance. But secondly, even insofar as you are legally able to participate in the army, we think that women will feel very uncomfortable participating in that field. Why? Firstly, because the army is at the very least likely to be a majority of men, because that is the way that social constructs exist and that armies tend to be constructed. And secondly, because armies often have very high rates of sexual assault. The reason we think women are the most, are one of the most important stakeholders in this debate is that 
that female refugees are often victims of that same sexual assault that they suffered while in transit from their state to the state to which they are going. And we think asking them to return to an environment in which they feel afraid of the exact same safety that they were fleeing is a heinously evil thing to do. And it will cause them not to do it in the first place, which means that these incredibly, incredibly you know, you know, suffering people will miss out. Secondly, people with post-traumatic stress disorder. If you have lived in a conflict zone such as Syria or one of the, those in sub-Saharan Africa, you are likely to not be in a great state of mental health because you have been constantly engaged in a war zone. You have been afraid of your safety for literally years. And the idea of asking you to return to a military, even if it's in a relatively menial role, still puts you back in an environment where fighting is seen as normal. And you're unlikely to want to join an army because you're unsure of what that army will ask you to do. So even if it is true that the government Ben says you'll only be doing menial tasks. We think that those people who know that they cannot face war will not sign up to this policy. They will not ascribe or will be willing to volunteer to participate in the army. And that means those people suffer. Those most affected by conflict in a really upsetting way are those who are least able to participate in this policy. That's why we think that this policy is evil. Maybe that the allocation is arbitrary. That's way better than crowding out the most vulnerable people. Second issue in this speech, why this hurts refugee flow. So, uh, the UNHCR requires or, or requests that people seek asylum in the nearest possible port. Obviously, we acknowledge that is very difficult, and we do not begrudge refugees who are unable to do so, but we do prefer it if refugees do that where they can. We think that this policy will encourage refugees not to seek uh, asylum near them, but to go further away because they do not want to participate in military service for some of the reasons that I just outlined. What are the consequences? Firstly, we think the rest stops taking refugees because it's much easier to spin a narrative that these refugees are jumping the queue. They're not engaging in the policy that we agree upon, they're engaging in a policy that they see as their own, and they just want to come to our nice country, and it justifies them giving them less aid to places like Turkey, because the overall beneficiaries of, of refugees goes down. Secondly, you create a flourishing people smuggling industry through complex routes throughout Africa that already exists. This also enhances my material about women that I just put forward, because the people smuggling industry is also rife with sexual assault, and we think that far more people will engage in that people smuggling industry to get to overloaded places like Greece. The most important people in this debate were those suffering most from conflict, and they were women. Those people cannot serve in the military or will serve far less than men. That's a disaster. Proud to oppose. Books, 
janitors, other people that serve the military do not count as military service, but even more so when they talk about language being a barrier. If they think that people are going to have a language barrier, it's actually unlikely they get placed in combat roles, because we think that not being able to speak the language of your commanding officer is probably a pretty hard thing to overcome when you're in these combat situations. Also recognize that many of these people are not actively engaging in the combat zones that they are directly uh, next to, as opposed to what opposition would rather have you believe. And same thing goes with people with PTSD. Yes, it might be difficult for these people to be able to get positions in the military and combat roles, but there are other routes that they can take in order to get in through this program. And now, uh, we also, uh, secondly, the second thing that they talk to you about is why sexual assault is problematic. We're not going to deny that the military in these countries probably does have issues with sexual assault. We're definitely not going to argue against that. What we are going to talk about is the comparative, though. What we think is likely to happen to these people if they're not allowed into the military is they're, one, going to be stuck in these refugee camps, where it's also true that sexual assault rates are alarmingly high, and these people are not going to be in a comparatively massive disadvantage. We think where you have areas where there's more military oversight, oversight of superiors, you're more likely to be safe from these things than you are in a refugee camp, or the other alternative is that these people never get long-term asylum and are forced to go back to their homes where they're fleeing from, these areas where they're feeling persecuted even outside of times of conflict, which means they're probably not returning to anything that's particularly good in a comparative sense either. That being said, uh, before I go on, I'll take open. As we told you, when granting asylum is seen as a humanitarian obligation is when states don't make arbitrary distinctions either on economic efficiency or ability to fight. Show us why you want to impose conditions at all. So, I don't understand why if you view it as a moral good thing that you take these people, why it gets rid of the factual, why it gets rid of the fact that there are a limited number of asylum spots that you can deal with. Countries cannot afford to take in the long run thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that may be reliant on them in order to survive. It's simply not a feasible option, which is why we in this closing government choose to deal with the imperative. So, Firstly, there's the possibility that it will be arbitrary, that people will simply be taken at a random chance, maybe they'll come out of the lobby or things like that. We think that that is problematic because it's the most unfair, because it doesn't give anyone an opportunity to actually try and earn their spot in that state. It gives no, uh, it gives no opportunity for people who are in the hardest situations to earn that opportunity. But we think that this is the least likely option. We think the most likely option is that people or that countries are only going to take skilled laborers. This is because it allows people to battle against all the animosity that opening and uh, government tells you that exists in these countries, the animosity that these refugees and long-term asylum seekers face because they're seen as sucking the resources out of states, they're often seen as dangerous within these states, and skilled laborers are viewed as more educated and comparatively, in that sense, also more and also less dangerous. Whether or not this is true, this is the perception that people see in those countries, and this is why we think this is what you're most likely going to get on the opposition side. Why do we think that this is problematic? Because it means that those people who are coming from countries in which they've had no opportunity for education, in which they have no opportunity to gain wealth, affluence, or connections to those outside their country are always going to, the pe going to be the people that are denied long-term asylum on their side of the house. It means the people with the least opportunity to flee to other nations, the least monetary ability to get out on their own in any other regards, or the least opportunity to return to their homes and build a life for themselves because they haven't been given the opportunity to be educated are always going to be the people on side opposition that never get the opportunity to, be, uh, to seek this long-term asylum and gain the safety. Why do we think in that sense we have a comparison comparatively much more fair system on our side of the house, because we give everyone at least an opportunity to earn their place in that state. Again, because it's, it, do, it doesn't just depend on people serving in a combat role. It can also be someone saying, I'm going to give up a year of my life to do intelligence work, or I'm going to give up a year of my life to make sure the troops that are ensuring that this country is protected are going to be fed in the long run. This means that individuals are of all stripes are able to earn their opportunities, whether or not they're educated, whether or not they can read or write or any of those things. These people are able to earn their spot because they're coming from conflict zones, we think that this is going to be a vast majority of the worst of OO says this is coercive. Firstly, I think it's comparatively more, uh, less, you get comparatively more agency than you would in the alternative, as I've laid out. We think there's no reason why state has an, uh, the state as an entity has an obligation to take these people, and therefore, you don't think it particularly matters whether it's coercive. Furthermore, they never explain to us why this is coercive on the part of the state. We think it's just coercive on the part of like, life. It's coercive that people have been forced out of their state. It's coercive that people are fleeing from conflict zones. Yeah, that really sucks, but that's not the problem of the state that has to deal with deciding who's 
who's going to be allowed in and who's not going to be allowed in. And finally, we think that we've shown you on government that there are true benefits to serving in the military, that just having someone come into the state and not have a guaranteed job or anything of the like is actually going to gain you. We've explained to you that you're likely going to get monetary benefits in a way to build a life within that state. When you have an income, you're allowed to accumulate wealth, you're able to pay your way through the state in some regard, or at least save up while you're in the military, and it gives you an opportunity for advancement because militaries are surprisingly largely meritocratic, and we think it gives you an opportunity, even if you're an unskilled laborer, even if you're someone that has no other education, it gives you a chance to rise up and actually create a life for yourself in this new state. Opposition has never dealt with the comparative in this round, so when they come up here and they tell you that they're just going to take everyone, don't believe them. They need to be realistic. That's why we're very proud to propose.
military, which is a significantly male-dominated, a significantly masculine environment that is more likely to be harsher to women than the outside community. But equally, when you are in the military, you are sent to conflict zones for a person with PTSD. That is a terribly traumatic environment for you to be in. They tell us, oh, well, it's okay, because you won't necessarily be given a combat role. We tell you that if you do not speak the language of that country, if you do not understand anything about the military, if you do not have medical training or logistics training, you probably can't be given a high-level officer's role in that military. In fact, the easiest role for you to be given is to just be given a gun and sent out to the front lines. They tell us you won't speak the same language as your commander, but you don't need to speak that many words of the language that that military operates in to be told to fire your gun. We tell you that is why these people will overwhelmingly be given low-level combat roles as opposed to roles in medical or logistic or administrative positions that you wanted to talk about. That is terrible for these people who are already traumatised, who already have limited support systems in that country. We, we think that that is a, a deeply unfair policy to those people only. Okay, but you don't need much training to just be a janitor or a cook. But more importantly, what you have to engage with is it's not a question of what the optimal method of redistribution would be if we have perfect, absolute political capital. Okay, we yeah. told you we get more refugees overall, and that's better. Okay, well, let's talk about this then. Because the opening half wants to tell us, well, this is about working out a trade-off between how, like, will that refugee, like, pay taxes in the future, and then how much will you spend on them while they're a refugee? We told you that was largely irrelevant, right? Because those countries have already opted into a system where they signed a refugee convention that equally guaranteed their citizens a bundle 